Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC. It's uh, great to uh, be with everyone today, and thank you for that introduction. It's nice to speak uh, to our Rotary audience in a city where I grew up, and for many years, uh, as Ralph mentioned, I was in the restaurant business. In addition to Ruth's Chris, we had TJ Ribs and Ninfas and Rafinos, to name a few. Uh, in my role at the LRA, I spend a great deal of time in Baton Rouge engaging with our legislator and our industry regulators. And we also operate our advocacy activities from the LRA House, which is our advocacy base located near the state capitol. I'm here to speak about the challenges our Louisiana restaurants, bars, and hospitality-related businesses are facing. But first, I'd like to share with you a brief video, and I hope this makes you hungry. Louisiana restaurants are open and ready to serve you. This is Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser. Satisfy your cravings with world-famous Louisiana seafood. All the flavors you love, prepared by our world-famous chefs, and fresh from our bountiful waters to your plate. So head over to your local favorite restaurant and be sure to ask for authentic Louisiana seafood. Brought to you by the Louisiana Restaurant Association and Louisiana Seafood Board. A perfect pair. Through a partnership we had with Louisiana Seafood and Lieutenant Governor Billy Nungesser, this ad has run statewide uh, during the months of July and August. Just to remind our customers that restaurants are open for business and that we sure take our seafood very seriously here. Let me just take a moment and, and talk to you about the Louisiana Restaurant Association and what we do. Uh, we're the advocate for the restaurant, bar, hotel, hospitality industry. And at the beginning of 2020, we had just over 4,400 members in our association. 100% of our revenue is generated from dues, our trade show, and industry-focused training products, specifically ServeSafe for food safety and alcohol training. We don't receive a dollar of tax revenue or government funding. So each year, just like in your business, we have to fund our operations through doing the best job possible for our members to earn their participation. In addition to advocacy at the state and local level through our partnership with the National Restaurant Association, we provide federal advocacy as well. We share information that can help our members run a more profitable business. And we also operate an industry-focused workers' comp self-insurers program that covers almost a billion dollars in industry payroll since 1982. Restaurants employ just over 200,000 people statewide, making us the first or second largest employer in the state. And in New Orleans, we're the largest employer. And we have a broad list of connected businesses that are part of our supply chain. We're the industry that offers second chances and sometimes third chances too. We have programs to attract youth employment, apprenticeships for skills development, outreach to the military, and we execute a program called HOPES, which provides opportunities for those previously incarcerated seeking a new future. I'm one of those people who spent the bulk of my work life in the restaurant business. My first job was washing dishes at Ralph and Kaku's as a teenager, and I also spent time working behind the bar at the Florida Lee on Government Street. The industry's provided me a great opportunity for personal and financial success. And as Ralph mentioned, as I'm serving as chair of the National Restaurant Association's Educational Foundation this year, it also works with the LRA to support ProStart, which is a program that we execute in approximately 60 high schools statewide, serving over 1,300 students in a two-year curriculum that offers management and culinary tracks. ProStart is also part of the Jumpstart program that allows high school graduates to move from school to a career. The LRA in 2020 has provided over $50,000 in educator grants for classroom instruction. And in August, we released $60,000 in post-secondary scholarships to those students who are pursuing a career in our industry. As Ralph mentioned, I'm extremely proud of our team at the NRAEF for their efforts in assisting our industry workers early in the pandemic before any other relief programs had been created. Creating the Restaurant Employee Relief Fund to provide $500 grants for our critical workers was a lifeline that was so important to our industry workforce. The first person to sign on with us was Guy Fietti of Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives fame of the Food Network. Guy became a key partner and our spokesperson in less than three weeks, with Guy's help, we raised just over $21.5 million. It came from over 13,000 companies, 
foundations, and individuals who contributed to this fund. And to add to this focus, Guy was quarantined at his home in Northern California. He came up with the idea of having some of his favorite past guests on Triple D, sending their favorite menu items to his home for he and his sons to prepare live on their Friday show. It also allowed those participating chefs and restaurants to promote they could offer this same service by mailing it or overnighting it to consumers. It was a real win-win for all. Other industry funds focused on Louisiana were provided through the Greater New Orleans Foundation and a generous contribution from Mrs. Gail Benson, as well as the Louisiana Hospitality Foundation, which launched two funds, including one specifically for bar staff, seated with a gift from Crescent Crown Distributing. Our industry is part of the fabric of each community. Our average member has revenue of approximately a million dollars and 15 to 20 team members. They're your neighbors who contribute food or sponsorships for charitable, civic, school, and sports endeavors. From the outfield signs to the gift card at an auction or the food for an event, they reinvest in their communities. And Louisiana is one of those states that has a significant percentage of independent restaurants. And those that are chains or franchises are typically owned by someone who lives in your community. Think of the Veluzzo family and their legacy with McDonald's that's now expanded to its third generation. A few years ago, we honored the Marino family of Gino's restaurant by inducting them into the LRA Hall of Fame. I'll bet few of you know that Gino's is the oldest full service restaurant in Baton Rouge. So many of our legendary independent restaurants have passed. Mike and Tony's, Don Seafood, Bob and Jake's, The Original Village, Jack Sabin's, and Jamanko's, just to name a few. Businesses speak about resiliency and how they're able to overcome events that in most cases are unexpected, and in the case of COVID-19 specifically, unprecedented. But to be resilient, many elements have to come together to make it happen. I'd like to believe the LRA was thinking ahead when we launched a COVID task force that started meeting daily in late February. We were brainstorming ideas and thoughts on how to help our members navigate what was becoming the focus of our nation. But what we were thinking about quickly became irrelevant. Let me take you back to March 16th, the moment the first COVID domino fell for the restaurant industry, beginning a process that's consumed our focus for almost six months. On that Monday morning, I was speaking to a gathering at the New Orleans Sheraton with 100 restaurant tours to discuss capacity restrictions we just spent the weekend negotiating with the mayor of New Orleans, her team, and the leadership of the Louisiana Department of Health. We developed a detailed rollout to allow restaurants and bars to remain in operation. While I was on stage addressing the socially distanced crowd, and that's actually the first time I'd seen a room set up in that manner, I received a call from the governor's office. After excusing myself to take the call, I heard news that would forever change the lives of everyone in that room. He was calling to inform me that the case numbers for COVID in our state were spreading at a dangerous pace and that later that day he would announce the closure of dine-in service at restaurants statewide, effective at midnight that night. Needless to say, that announcement cleared the room in very short order. I hosted a call of many of our New Orleans legacy operators the next morning. I had representatives of the great brands like Commander's Palace, Arnaud's, Galatoire's, Antoine's, Mr. B's Bistro, Dickie Brennan Restaurants, Ralph Brennan Restaurant Group. Most of these restaurants generate up to 40% of their sales in group dining. It's generated from corporate meetings, trade show, and travel tied to events. And in the resilience we'd seen after Katrina and the effects of the BP oil spill disaster, these restaurateurs idea was to let's just agree to close for a month and this will be over and behind us. Knowing this audience of strong type A leaders, I was forced to ask the critical question, what if it isn't over in a month? And they said, how can that be? That's how little we knew what to expect in mid-March. And due to the immediacy of the governor's order, most operators had little time to prepare, to wind down their operations, to run down their inventories, and to tell their staff members how they'd be paid, just to figure out how their business would survive. Restaurants depend on sales volume that provides cash flow. It's a low margin business. One making 10% or higher is in the minority. So when the sales stopped abruptly, so did the available cash to fund the business, and their fixed costs continued. Why? 
Well, restaurants have high fixed costs, which include rent, utilities, insurance, and maintenance. And when sales volumes decline, this fixed cost consumes a higher percentage of sales dollars in most cases, going from 30 to 50% of revenue or higher. Full service restaurants can't exist at even 50% of prior sales volumes. And while curbside pickup and delivery was a band-aid, it wasn't a long-term solution. Since that day, a series of government orders and subsequent relief efforts has created unforeseen challenges testing the strongest among our industry. In order to survive, restaurants needed to learn to pivot, which is the new it word in today's world of restaurant operations. Dining room closures left many full service or fine dining restaurants at a loss for how to pivot their made to order cuisine for takeout and delivery, where service and ambiance are key elements of the dining experience. The back of the house teams were charged with developing creative menu options with the limitations of a plastic delivery container. Even today at 50% capacity, many full service or white tablecloth restaurants opted to remain closed until they can resume a level of operation to deliver the guest experience that's so much a part of their restaurant's identity. The fast casual and quick service restaurants were in a better position to operate during the closure. However, it too was not without pain points. Takeout containers were hard to find and PPE in the early days was also a challenge. As COVID cases increased, the pool of restaurant staff who wanted to work began to shrink. But those who've retained the highest percentage of sales were those operations in the quick service area that could generate revenue through their drive-through windows. Most simply closed their dining room or on demand at the counter options and focused on efficiency at the drive-through or through using third-party delivery. Our industry was strong advocates for the CARES Act and through the PPP elements that provided a lifeline to so many member businesses. Unfortunately, the initial window of eight weeks just wasn't enough time to recover for restaurants. And while we learned yesterday that Senate Leader McConnell is proposing another limited round of PPP and additional unemployment relief, I'm doubtful that the House of Representatives will agree to this approach. Speaker Pelosi commented yesterday that the Senate's skinny legislative package was emaciated in her view, somewhat dooming the hopes for it to move forward. The CARES Act also included a House-required $600 weekly supplement to unemployment pay. Certainly it was a good idea, but the largest prior federal supplement was $50 a week. What did we learn? Almost two thirds of the unemployment recipients were earning more not working than they did when they were employed. So it became a disincentive for many who had been furloughed to return to work. This further restricted the restaurant industry in being able to predict the staff needed to operate on a restricted capacity basis. The Louisiana Workforce Commission was simply overwhelmed with the number of first time and continuing unemployment claims and implementing the federal supplement that it couldn't manage removing those workers from benefits whose employers recalled them and the employee refused to return to work. As the unemployment stimulus came to an end on July 31st, eligible workers found themselves on the fence on whether or not they should return to work or if they could find work at all. Let's go back to the timeline for COVID. Less than a week after restaurants were closed for dine-in, the governor issued his stay-at-home order that closed offices just as schools were also closing and working remotely became a real thing. Many restaurants offer a staff or family meal prior to service each day. It's part of the culture of the industry for many full service operations. And from this launched the idea of a marketable service for families and parents in search of convenience in their compressed roles as employee, teacher, and at time caregiver. Many restaurants have continued to offer these family meals and more restaurants are embracing delivery options in addition to curbside pickup. One quick comment about third-party deliveries. In our on-demand, get-it-now world, there are a number of third-party delivery providers that allow you to order through their app from your favorite restaurant. Please know that the fees charged to the restaurant for this service can consume up to 30% of the value of the order. And in a low-margin business, the restaurant simply can't absorb that type of hit. It's why you've seen more restaurants offering delivery with their personnel in limited delivery areas. 
We've conducted multiple surveys of Louisiana restaurants, and unfortunately, the results aren't good. We estimate that as a result of COVID, 25% of all Louisiana restaurants will close permanently. This figure could reach 40 to 50% for New Orleans restaurants due to their reliance on visitors. Those numbers are staggering. I was speaking with a reporter a few weeks ago, and she noted, we follow the bankruptcy filings and haven't seen many for restaurants. My comment was restaurants simply close. They return the keys to the landlord or the bank and walk away. As restaurant dining rooms reopened at 25% and today at 50%, and hopefully as soon as today we'll learn if the state is moving to phase three at 75% capacity, the restaurant cost structure has made owners take a hard look at each area of their operation. Staffing, supply chain, and service options have the greatest impact to a restaurant's ability to not just break even, but be profitable. When you hear a restaurant tour say today we're breaking even, that means they may be covering their labor, their cost of goods sold, and perhaps some occupancy expenses, but they aren't making a profit and more than likely the owner isn't getting paid either. Offering outdoor dining has proven to be an economic lifeline for some restaurants where it's applicable. However, our state's climate isn't the most conducive to dining outside. But for some guests, it's the only alternative they'll consider to return to a restaurant. In addition to using existing decks and patios, restaurants have been claiming space from parking lots and green spaces in order to increase seating capacity. But this is really a temporary solution at best. The modifications necessary to allow for this type of seating in the long term would require capital at a time when operators simply are stretched to the limit by pandemic diminished, diminished cash flow. I touched earlier on restaurant staffing, and I'll elaborate more on it now. The unemployment stimulus of $600 added to the state benefit delivered at a target minimum wage of over $15 an hour. This had the impact of inflating wages and raising labor costs for restaurants as they sought to attract employees to grow their business. If wages stay inflated, you can expect you'll pay higher menu prices in the future. There simply isn't enough profit margin to not pass these cost increases on through menu increases. Supply chain challenges are also a reality. You've seen it at the grocery store and it's also affected our food costs, particularly beef and seafood prices. You've also noticed that restaurant menus have shrunk. Where you might have 25 to 50 options in the past, you may only see six to 10 options for dinner. Preparation of a large variety of dishes requires more staff, which is uncertain, and their expense also impacts the cost to produce a menu item. September's upon us and recovery from Hurricane Laura is impacting our members in a 20 parish area up the western border of our state from Lake Charles to Shreveport. We're also proud of our LRA members who are doing what they always do, volunteering their time to help their neighbors and impacted communities with food, water, and supplies. They don't seek recognition, just the chance to pay it forward. The value of a hot meal and a smile to those facing the challenges of recovering from a disaster can't be understated. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank our legislature, our Speaker of the House, Clay Shakespeare, and our President of the Senate, Paige Cortez, for helping provide some clarity through their leadership and statutes to support businesses operating during the COVID crisis. Senate Bill 508 by Senator Patrick McMath provides a liability shield for restaurants who operate during the time of the governor's emergency order. No guests can seek damages or allege they contracted COVID-19 on those premises if the restaurant follows the state's reopening guidelines. Also, House Bill 826 by Representative Thomas Presley provides relief to a broader list of businesses, and both were signed into law. And there's always the question of an essential worker and is contracting COVID covered by workers' comp. In Louisiana, the sole remedy for an injured worker is the workers' comp system. Typically, to be covered, it must be resulting from an accident or injury or an occupational illness like mesothelioma. Just as it is hard to prove where someone contracted a cold or the flu, I expect this will be tested in court, but tough to prove. What have we learned? Quite a bit, actually. Through our partnership with the National Restaurant Association, the Centers for Disease Control, and the Food and Drug Administration, 
we developed a national set of reopening guidelines that we shared with the Louisiana Department of Health and the state fire marshal as they developed the Open Safely Louisiana guidelines. We've innovated using plexiglass and other screens to provide additional guest and staff safety. We've worked to limit waiting in groups for tables instead of using technology and text messages to advise the guests their table is ready. We've expanded the use of reservations for many operators who never used them before. We've added industry specific training called Thrive Louisiana that provided a simple online portal for industry staff to learn how to work safely in the COVID crisis. And we offered it for free. We've learned how to help our members navigate the SBA, economic injury disaster loans, and the Main Street lending platform from the Federal Reserve. I've spoken more about PPP and the emerging rules process than I care to remember. And our legislature also created a Main Street recovery program using CARES Act dollars that can reimburse up to $15,000 in expenses for your business due to COVID for those businesses who apply. And should additional federal relief pass, our delegation has indicated it won't be until later this month or early October. And unfortunately, that could be too late for many operators. And while I respect the governor's careful approach to this crisis, we need to be transparent in the measures, triggers, and outcomes we seek so business people can make the right choices for their business. I don't believe the statutes that define a governor's authority for the states of emergency ever intended for them to be used for six months or longer. We need a timeline of outcomes to move past phase three and on to phase four and beyond. The biggest limitation of the restaurant industry outside of capacity restrictions is the challenge of rebuilding the guests' confidence that it's safe to dine out and return to their favorite restaurant. Through our partnership with the National Restaurant Association, we launched the Serve Safe Dining Commitment recently, which provides a set of training and operating standards that have third-party validation and are there to build guest confidence. Early on in phases one and two, we work to walk our members through how to deal with positive tests or exposure quarantine. We hear less of this today as practices have been developed and fully implemented. Restaurants currently operating are spending more time investing in training, safety, hygiene, and sanitation. Restaurateurs want to comply with regulations and guidelines as reducing the spread of COVID-19 is critical for our industry and the state's economy moving forward. To promote the Serve Safe Dining commitment, we've just launched the national advertising campaign, Dub Your Table is Ready. Savor the vibe you'll only get when you dine out at a restaurant. I'd like to share a quick commercial for you. Look for this window cling at restaurants as you begin to visit. It's uh, always good sometimes to hear the sounds of the kitchen and the sounds of a restaurant rather than having an announcer tell you what you should be feeling at that time. The COVID crisis has shown that restaurants, bars, caterers, clubs, and hotels can innovate and adapt. Operating awareness has never been higher, but we have to reopen the access to keep these businesses alive. If a business is already heavily, lever heavily leveraged with debt, Another round of lending isn't going to help them if their collateral is already committed. But as I mentioned resilience, there are still new restaurants opening during this crisis, like Modesto Tacos Tequila and Whiskey by Ozzy Fernandez in Baton Rouge. We wish Ozzy and his team the best. If you want to help, visit your favorite restaurant and observe what they're doing within the guidelines. Order takeout or delivery tonight. It provides a break for you and a lifeline for the restaurant business. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to share with you the challenges our restaurant and hospitality industry has faced and what they're doing to stay alive and adapt in these challenging times. If you'd like more information on the Louisiana Restaurant Association or any of our programs, you can visit us at lra.org or lra.org, or you can email us at communications at lra.org. 
I really appreciate you having me join you today. It's been a pleasure. That's been fascinating. Thank you, Stan. Um, if you have uh, a moment for a few, few questions. Absolutely. So Jeff Zimmerman wants to know, do you know if restaurants have experienced an increase in cyber food ordering and delivery services like Uber and or Eats? And do you have any statistics or thoughts on, on these services? Well, surpri surprisingly, hey, Guy, that, that so many of these third-party delivery companies with their co competitive information don't really share that with the industry. But we can tell you what we know anecdotally from the restaurants that many of them are seeing the takeout and delivery business that was 10 to 15% of their business grow to 25 or 30% of their business right now. So again, that's a lifeline. So if they're doing 25% uh, using a delivery uh, protocol and 25% dine-in, they're still only at about 50% of their pre-COVID volume. I, actually, my youngest uh, is a college and for, for, for job drives for uh, Grubhub, I believe it is, so, or DoorDash, one of those. So, yes, and, and is quite busy. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, it is something that I'm glad that we've had uh, as an option because, uh, you know, some people don't have the ability uh, transportation-wise to get to that area restaurant, and these third-party and app-based uh, delivery uh, providers certainly uh, fill a need. So what kind of resources do you have available to restaurateurs to help them, or give them guidance and how to get through all the, everything going on? Early on in the COVID crisis, we pivoted our information at LRA.org to being free. There's nothing behind a paywall anymore. We wanted to help our industry, whether you were a member of the LRA or not. And our team here, whether it's in communications, whether it's in advocacy, whether it's in policy, or you have a legal question or a healthcare question, can answer that for you. And that's really one of the things that we've been most proud of is how our team has stood all of this information forward to provide it to our industry at no charge, because we really do believe that it's the right thing to do. That's that's really awesome. I I I our yeah, it's, it's really hard to ask someone who's going through a challenge if you're a member, and that's the only way I'm going to help you. Uh, we've kind of knocked that out of our vocabulary a long time ago. And what we hope we can do is provide some value or some help to someone so they'll look to us in the future, whether it's for food safety training or alcohol training, or if they'd like to join and become a member of our organization. Truly a Louisiana icon. I love this. Um, Lane uh, McDaniel wants to know, do you think many of the uh, ad adaptations made during the pandemic, such as home or neighborhood delivery, will carry over and be a permanent extension after this crisis is over with? It depends on what segment of the restaurant. I think if you're looking at fast casual or quick service, I think certainly that that's going to be part of their model going forward. For restaurants that are more delivering that experience of uh, personal service and table side service. I think that they're going to look at, at what part of their menu can be easily executed and that fits a delivery model. And some of them will get out of that business altogether. You know, one of our iconic restaurants, Commander's Palace, uh, tried that for a week uh, when COVID hit and they walked away from it because they just couldn't make sense of it with their food and deliver what their guests visual expectation was uh they're reopening their restaurant on friday uh, which is the first time they've opened since march we've also got a few others opening down in new orleans but uh it's been it's been quite a challenge for them because you know new orleans had 19 and a half million visitors last year and we're expecting that number to be less than half of that that uh account for this year. So uh, it's it's a challenge uh, in this marketplace that's so heavily dependent on visitors. I could not imagine Commander's Palace being delivered to the house. It's just, <laughs> well, you know, they came up with a they came up with a really good innovation during the, the crisis on Wednesday night. They were doing a wine and food tasting where you could actually uh, log in and do it on Zoom and uh, their wine director would share with you the, the flavors and the profiles and you could order a package that came from the cheese came from a grocery store and the wine came from a retailer. So it was really a, a, a fun and innovative way for them to stay connected to their customers. I like that. 
Uh, Nancy Stitch asked, have you heard anything about the loan forgiveness program for the PPP loan program other than what you you'd mentioned a little while ago? Uh, you know, the, that program has continued to evolve uh, as we shared with, with our industry. Typically, when the federal government passes legislation, uh, it takes a long time to pass the legislation. Then it goes to the department uh, that is responsible for executing it, in this case, the Treasury. And the, the Treasury would spend probably 60 to 90 days developing rules, and then they would put it out for comment for 60 to 90 days. And then they would come up with the final rules 60 to 90 days after that. When it came to the CARES Act and PPP, from the time it passed till the time it launched was less than two weeks. So we're going to continue to see the evolution of this. Uh, what I think is, is challenging is for those people who took PPP early that use their eight weeks because they were following the rules, they may get total forgiveness, but without another round, they may not have enough capital to launch their business back. Uh, when they did the modification to the CARES Act, which passed with bipartisan support, it worked very, very well to, for those people who hadn't taken PPP at that time and were considering it. But again, my, my recommendation is to always talk to your CPA, or your tax advisor, uh, look at the guidance that's produced by the IRS and Treasury regularly because it's continuing to evolve. Yes, it, it, that has been really a fascinating process to watch unfold. Um, yeah, government is not made at the federal level is not made for speed. Uh, mm -hmm. It's it's made for it's made for sound practice, but it, it's not used to being innovative and, and fast. And it's usually not very interesting to watch. It's kind of like the <laughs> soft <laughs> you stole my line. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Karen Profito wants to know uh, what long term changes do you think there will be into how restaurants function? I think I think. Uh, Part of the, the challenge will be how guests wait for their table. I think it will impact uh, uh, requiring use of technology and texting messages to get people to do that. I think you'll see more restaurants, and I don't mean to say it downscale, but the type of restaurant, more things in the fast casual will do things like call ahead seating and uh, using apps to make reservations uh, so that they can accommodate you and at the same time plan for your arrival. I think you're going to continue to see deep cleaning, sanitation, and hygiene practices followed. Um, you know, Louisiana, I, I talked with the head of food safety for uh, the Department of Health earlier today, and we've got an envious record when it comes to food safety in Louisiana. We, we haven't killed people with, with foodborne illness, and we'd like to keep that going. So we work very closely with the Department of Health and our regular regulators to make sure that our members and our industry has the best information possible. Today, we were talking about boil water advisories along the western border of Louisiana. We have over 100 water systems that are down. And when that happens, a restaurant has to boil water to prepare its food. It can't use its automatic coffee makers or soda fountains or bar guns. Uh, we, we in New Orleans, our members in New Orleans know how to do it because it happens here regularly, unfortunately. But uh, in smaller communities, they, they're not used to those types of things. And helping them adapt to that is something that LDH reached out to us and asked us to help with. Margaret King asks, did the industry consider marketing afternoon hours as meals service hours? Are marketing uh, something long, uh, lingering meals or face-to-face -face meals with friends? Would, would the additional revenue outweigh variable cost and any kind of potential volume customers if the marketing in the traditional low volume hours uh, could change? Well, the, the, the challenge with, with, again, expanding operating hours, because we have a lot of restaurants, and, I, and I'll use some in the, in, the, in the CBD or the French Quarter in New Orleans for that matter, they're only operating four days, three or four days a week because they can't get enough staff to operate those extended hours. Uh, they'd love to be operating seven days a week and have business on seven days. But when you talk about that swing time in the afternoon, uh, you know, when you're at 50% at capacity and you're at, at 50 to 60% revenue, you don't have any extra dollars to market and do those promotional things unless you're using your internal sources like social media, like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram to talk to your install base of people that are already following your restaurant. Uh, going out and buying media at that particular time is just not something a lot of industry folks can put their hands around. But 
these are the types of innovations that we're always talking about with our members to try to create a better mousetrap, to try to create a better way for people to engage with your business. You know, when you walk into a restaurant and you see it appropriately socially distanced, just remember that, you know, a restaurant was made to not fill that restaurant each night. It was made to fill it once, twice, or three times in order to be profitable. That's, that's a great point. Um, Stan, I really want to thank you for taking some time to visit with us and share the information about the Restaurant Association and the restaurant, you know, the dining world here in, in the greater Louisiana, as we all do enjoy our restaurants. So again, thank you very much. Well, hey, guy, what we like to say here is it's not just uh, how we prepare food, it's what we prepare that makes Louisiana difference. And our food is such a huge part of our culture. So thanks for allowing us to join you today. You bet. Thanks again, Stan. Support provided by Walters, Papillon, Thomas, Collins, LLC.